Today on a very special episode of Cosmic Road, uh, we are joined by Christopher Noel. So uh, get in here. It's going to be a great show. Uh, Christopher is an author and researcher. Uh, he, uh, I don't know if you'd describe yourself as an experiencer or not, although I know you've seen some stuff. Uh, but welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you so much, Jack. I'm I'm uh, I'm one of your ten thousand addicted subscribers <laughs> who every morning can't start the day without the eight o'clock your time, nine o'clock my time um, update. And um, your consistency and your work ethic are are lost on nobody. Well, most people it's lost on, but not not your fans, not your growing almost ten thousand, almost ten thousand, almost ten thousand. That's right. That's right. Base. I was excited to see that. It's great. So I, we all owe you a great gratitude, and um, and you jumped on the the uh, epic uh, press release today. Um, you've already posted your episode about that, so that people should watch that. They probably already have, um, but I hope tens of thousands of people watch that and um, recognize that you're you're a, le a leading light in shedding light upon the leading edge of what's going on here. So. Yeah, the, the Nazca mummies, because that's what we're talking about, guys, because, uh, yeah, th it was an amazing press event, and uh, there was even an endoscopy uh, of uh, of the one specimen, Mon Mon Monta, uh, Montserrat, 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 uh, an, an endoscopy showing the, 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 the fetus. Uh, yeah, the they, they, were, they, they both did the tom tomography, which we're um, familiar with from the earlier um, analyses of the of the the subjects but in this case for the first time they actually put a, a um an endoscope tiny camera into the abdominal ca ca cavity of montserrat which is the new human sized but um sitting crumpled uh, sitting um with her legs all up and hands on her belly but roughly human sized uh new um specimen that they have just introduced to the world and they they put um, they found through tomography that she has a fetus in her abdomen with lots and lots of details about nine inches long, um, and but it's crumpled up too. So they're estimating that it fully extended. It would be nine inches long, and it has all of its vertebrae. You can see the ribs are forming, and you can see the head. You can see they say you can see. It's not entirely clear yet, but I take their word for it, and we'll have to confirm that visually as we get more information but they say she the fetus has three fingers and three toes just like mom just like dear old mom and uh so they then the, yesterday afternoon this is late breaking news that they that they shared in the press conference they put an endoscope into the abdomen and they could see the fetus directly on video with uh, you know the endoscope has a light that that uh, illuminates the area so they could see details of of the fetus they didn't press too far because they didn't want to um damage but you know it's it's even more exciting than tomography which which has a kind of air of um a sort of a medical uh mediation between us and the actual thing like a technological mediation of you know um and so this is this is direct video inside the abdomen it's fabulously exciting i mean this this specimen uh, montserrat looks a lot like maria um but we don't know if Maria was pregnant. It doesn't seem so, or they would have said said so. But it also it it's it also looks not unlike um, Josefina, who has eggs, and another has eggs too. So these these specimens are similar enough to have been all collected and, and um, entombed in the same um, citadel or caves cavern. So, but some of them have live birth. Some of them have are egg bearing so some are more reptilian and some are more mammalian or primate primate like or human like um so it's just just the the range of specimens that we have even working against the challenges of um the grave robbing industry and the black market industry and the government trying to suppress it all the peruvian government it's a, it's astonishing and a very thankful outcome so far that so much has been able to be um preserved for presentation to the world and we can see the the spectrum of of body plans and um, physiological expressions of this this um, hybridization process that must have gone gone on back in the day it's, it's so so appreciative 
that we managed to like um, to snatch this evidence, a lot of it out of the jaws of the forces that would suppress it, you know. I, I love that UFO disclosure is coming through the uh, Mexican and South American black market. I, uh, the, I know. The grave, I mean, uh, of course it would. I mean, it's not going to come from the, the U.S. government. Uh, so. I mean, this is exactly what would happen in a good movie, right? They, You know, you have this red herring, this massive red herring, which is the, the U.S. government and the, and the glacial process of disclosure with two steps forward and 1.9 steps back. Um, and and then through the back door, and then you know the movie goes, you know Nazca, and you see the map, you know, and the thing, and then, Peru, one, you know, one thousand two hundred, you know, year one thousand two hundred, and you see an animated, an excellently animated version of our species and these these little species and and their interaction, and then two thousand seventeen, you see like the grave robber. Um, Finding finding the uh, desiccated remains of the very same creatures that we just saw in in uh, animation and you know excellent animation like in the uh, Planet of the Apes uh, franchise the current Planet of the Apes it's just perfect it's a perfect movie but it's real it's all real except I perhaps for the for the fighting of the mantis being in the cave <laughs> yeah okay so about we that, don't know I... yet we don't know I, I've got that researcher I've been communicating with him the the oh, yeah. uh, Alan Perez. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get off on a different subject too much, but right. uh, so yeah, that, that researcher who was boots on the ground at the time, who went to the site and was interacting with the Tomb Raiders, uh, and who authenticates that the contents of that video, and he says they were killing beings, and then they, at a certain point they decided to, to capture them and sell them alive on the black market, and wow. he says all that stuff is real. Uh, you know, the artifacts and everything else in that video is real. And there's a lot more besides even crazier stuff that he, he goes into. Wow. I um, mean, and did you uh, ask yeah, him why, yeah, why I'm in communication so with him, but, but he's a, he's a Spanish speaker. Uh, so I'm trying to find a translator or some sort of translation software that I can use right. to have an interview with him. Otherwise I don't know how to do an interview. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> but uh, don't you yeah. wish we had paid more attention back in high school? I, Spanish? I, I know. Yeah, uh, yeah, my Spanish teacher uh, passed me under the condition that I would never take a Spanish class again. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's how bad I was. That's very good. Uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, uh, so you are a, a great author and researcher. You you uh, delved into subjects uh, that the connection between UFOs and the afterlife. You you've delved into Bigfoot. Uh, you know consciousness. Uh, there's uh, so many great subjects that you've explored and to some ex extent experienced. Uh, like I know you went to a seance when you were, you know, uh, exploring consciousness and, and the spiritual stuff, uh, and, and psi abilities and stuff. And you went to a seance and you saw some stuff. Um, uh, you, you, and so I, I consider you an experiencer in, in that respect. Uh, very limited, a very limited experiencer compared to most of the, the folks who are who are called experiencers. Back when I was 17, I had um, a very um, um, life-changing ghost conversation um, for a number of months. I had a friend who lived up the hill from me who was a woman um, 14 years older than me, and she she was my writing teacher in high school. And we became friends, and she told me that um, there were strange things going on in her house, like her husband would see a little ball of light come down at, over their bed at night when my friend Catherine was sleeping and hover over her head and then kind of dissipate. And um, and she said they saw a pillar of light in the corner of the room in the old part of the house. And so I said, well, let's try to contact it. You know, and, she, and luckily she was game. And so for the next three and a half months, we, uh, we, we um, conducted a conversation through both Ouija board and automatic writing um, with this, this, agent, this conscious agent, um, who told us all this stuff about why he was um, sort of uh, chained to the earthly plane. He had apparently killed his daughter, and we, we, he wanted us to somehow expiate that guilt. And, and uh, he, he said, like, he buried her in, down at the bottom of the field underneath this elm tree that was still there. And there was a spring at the bottom of the water spring and he said he buried her there in the fount at the fount of hell he was quite um poetic and he said he wanted us to go down and and gather our harvest of bones 
to somehow through this means to restore this daughter um, to kind of reverse the sin that he had, um, you know, uh, um, committed um, and help him to move on. He said that when he died, I said, what was it like when you first died? And he, he said, white, so white I was afraid. And then he said, dove towards sea of blue wonder. And then he said, held in massive hands, made to feel I should die again. And then when I went off to college, I didn't know what that meant. When I went off to college, I read St. Augustine. And he talks about the second death where you die physically. And then if you're sinful, you die further to the possibility of transcending to, to heaven. Um, so it, it fit in retrospect. And sometimes he, he would say he wanted um, Catherine and I to love each other and bear her again, bear the daughter again. And so, you know, we were like, we don't like each other that way. <laughs> hey, a murderous ghost trying to play matchmaker. Great. great. That's, what it, that's what it was. So did, did, anyway, and I had some physical um, experiences then too. One time well, I was going on. I, big... I, have to, I, I, I can't let you get off that easy. Did, did you dig up the, the, the bones? No, we never did. We were too spooked. We were, we were chicken. Yeah. yeah. We were yeller. We were yeller. Um, and so, but um, one time I was going on vacation, a family vacation that summer. And so I said to him, well, I'm, I'm going on vacation, John. Um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And then I left that room and then I went back to get a pencil that I had left there. And as I turned to leave again, I felt what I interpreted as a hand, but definitely something on the back of my head, on my hair. It felt kind of like half half um, um, normal density and, and half not, you know, just kind of like half dense. And it, it caressed the back of my head. Um, sometimes you'd be sitting in there and it would suddenly get really cold in the room, which is common. And uh, and we would say on the Ouija board, we'd say, why is it cold? And he said, X is here. It will not let me talk, you know. X is strong today. So whatever that, that is. And then um, most impressively, we would sit there and sometimes nothing would happen. And then we would get the sense because he he would have to sort of manifest outside the uh, wall of the house. And we would then we would suddenly hear this ringing bell. And he was, that meant he was there ready to communicate. And there is no bell in our reality. But we, we had a cassette recorder going so that we could just say the letters because the planchette would move so fast. We couldn't keep up. We couldn't write it down. So we would say the letters and then transcribe it later off the cassette recorder. And you can hear the bell on the cassette recorder. On the on the recording, so this is my introduction to the physical phenomena that can occur from some invisible agency. And for the rest of my life, this was forty five years ago, forty six years ago, and ever since then, I've known that there's this larger reality frame out there. And though I've never had another ghost experience, um, that has that is you know like um, sort of uh, um, established my worldview. And uh, it's it's been it's made it's made existing uh, more magical, you know, and more more um, sort of a sense of abundance and pregnancy just outside the known, you know, familiar reality. And so then, as you mentioned, I I um, um, wrote a, a I, I realized I should come full circle and start to investigate more about how it is that spirits can exist and can affect the physical world so i wrote a book called there is no veil because i think that the veil is a is a um a subjective construct i don't think it's an objective and necessary barrier because we all know of people who from childhood can see spirits all around them i don't you know i think it's a state of mind a mirage that we impose upon ourselves partly because everybody's not gifted enough to have the vision to see what's actually right around us and partly because you know forgetting the spirit side and the home that we go back to when we die is part of the deal being having a um, an earth life we want to have an authentic adventure here um and knowing too much about the fact that we're just heartbeat away from joining this other uh, more transcendent realm um wouldn't help us to be grounded in this world so i think that's part of it is the veil of forgetfulness that seems to be a natural part of existing here um so i wrote that book and then on the strength of that i got uh, invited to a seance in um, western new york not far from hydesville where 
the spiritualist movement began in 1848. And uh, in this seance, which was led by an internationally known, um, I was really lucky to ha have it so close by. It was nine hours driving, but so privileged because they're usually overseas someplace. These sort of elite level uh, physical physical mediumship seances. And by physical, I mean, you know, stuff happens, you know, phenomena occur that can be um, documented, um, like levitations and voices speaking from the midair, from just the air. Um, and so this guy is named Gary Mannion, and he's a British um, um, medium, physical medium, who's been healing people and doing mediumship ever since he was 14 years old. Now he's 35. He's just really fully developed and goes all over the world. Anyway, I was in this seance and the things that happened in there were I saw this um, um, in very low lighting. He's been doing it long enough that now it doesn't have to be um, pitch dark, which is usually the case in the developmental phase of the physical medium ship um, evolution because um, the subtle energies that are involved in um, manifestations from the spirit world are are um, overwhelmed and disrupted by the um, electromagnetic wavelengths that we are used to. Um, and of course, it gives skeptics plenty of ammunition. They go, oh, how convenient. It all takes place in the dark. But once you've developed over years and years, sometimes decades, you can then introduce light into the, um, into the enterprise and things can happen that people can see and videotape. Um, in fact, if I remember later, I'll give um, our listeners information about a video where you can see some of Gary Mannion's um, manifestations captured. Actually, I'll just say it now. Um, um, Eckhart Kruse, K-R-U-S, he is a German robotics and machine learning expert. And he's one of the brave um, and curious scientists, mainstream scientists who have um, risked their credibility by looking um, carefully and sincerely at physical mediumship. Many in the past have done so, but this is one of the contemporary scientists, still pretty young, who's who's doing that. And so um, I will ask that Jack put the link to that in the description. I'll give it to him after. I can't remember what the link, what the name of the video is. Um, so there's there's that. Anyway, so this same guy that that, that scientist is, look, is investigating and documenting um, is the one I was privileged enough to sit with, with about 18 other other folks. So we saw um, we saw a woman's chair being pushed by no visible means across the floor and then pulled back to where she had been sitting. We saw a um, seance trumpet, which are these tin, um, like megaphone-shaped objects that sometimes spirits speak through because it, it simply amplifies their sometimes very um, subtle voice. We saw them, two of them, levitate toward the ceiling and then stay up there. Um, and incidentally, um, I know I go on tangents as part of character flaw. Um, you know, Leslie Keene, who's big in, um, he, who's uh, an investigative journalist who's been um, very pivotal in the um, promulgating of information about the UFO UFO, um, UAP phenomenon. She also wrote a book called um, Surviving Death, which is an excellent book that I recommend highly. Just a handful of really persuasive, um, rigorously researched and documented works out there that I recommend this highly to convince you of the reality of um, our spirit nature in the afterlife. Um, she has been sitting in a physical mediumship seance for many years, and she... Um, she says, you know, I've seen, if you've seen objects levitating um, right in front of you, you realize that this is really happening. There's a, there must be a physics to this, a science to this, but the scientists aren't curious. And she wonders why, why aren't they more curious? This is actually happening. And it's, it's not, um, it's not due to any of the forces that we know from the physics that we've, we've been able to um, develop over the last 400 years. It's just not. There must be a whole other kind of matter and energy that's responsible for this, and it's it's got to be the matter and energy that uh, the the spiritual spiritual reality partakes of, and that 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 um, um, allows them to have agency upon the, our familiar world. 
Um, so, so um, in this seance, not only did um, I see this levitation in very low light, but a spirit hand, a spirit hand, a hand not connected to an arm and a body, um, handed me this a port. An a port. <laughs> An a port means um, any object that a port from the French meaning to bring, and it means in seance um, contexts, it means an object that appears out of thin air, out of apparently nowhere. And I got this little, the little, like a rock. Oh, that's good. Interesting. It might be, a, it might be a crystal or a gem if I were to, um, you know, put it in a tumbler. So far, I haven't done that. So all I know is it's a nondescript little rock. But the spirit hand gave it to me and it came out of it came out of nowhere because we fully examined the room before the seance and there were a lot of people got coins and, and little rocks and, so what did the hand look like was it just like a, your own it, it felt was a, it a little, male hand was it did it was any... a small it was a small male hand and i was skeptical because the medium too was small male but he was but two things he was his his hands were um, securely fastened to the chair with zip ties and you you know you could all sorts of magicians have a way of, of like working with that but a guy another guy in the seance went up to um, have his turn at the spirit hand and he burst into tears and later I asked him why and he said first the first hand was a small woman's hand and he felt that it was his mother's hand and you know you could feel anything. It's not persuasive, but then he had big hands, not at all like the medium's hands. Big hand, one hand, um, which he knew was his father's hand because he could. There was forget what it was. There was some trait of the hand that he knew, and so both his parents are, are dead, and so he, he convinced that this was first his mother's hand and then his father's hand, and they were very different sizes. So it wasn't the medium doing it. Could, could so, you see the hands? Very dimly, you can see it. Were they Very like see through? Were they like translucent or good? They were not. They were solid, which is exactly what Leslie uh, Keene described. She she sits in a um, a um, uh, seance led by the British medium Stuart Alexander, who has been doing this for forty years, and he's one of the most exhaustively studied and never remotely debunked practitioners of this of this um, sort of uh, enterprise and. She she sees um, ha a hand, I mean, a sort of a amorphous substance coming from the medium across a table. She describes this in her book and in interviews. Um, and it, then it, she watches, the table is illuminated from underneath. There's a light and it's glass. And then this oozing substance comes across and then it gradually forms fingers and they become more and more recognizable as a hand. And then... He holds it and it's it's solid. So when you say an oozing substance, are we talking ectoplasm? We're talking ectoplasm. I often don't use the E word because it turns people off, but it's an absolutely genuine thing. Um, and she describes it. And she, you know, Leslie Keen is an impeccable source. Uh, her brain, her, her mind is extremely even-handed and um, neutral and objective and skeptical in just the right way. You know, not cynical, but skeptical. And she describes this happening. She describes seeing levitation just like I saw. And in a little video I, I, um, that we might be able to play, uh, there are some examples of levitation where tables will, will uh, rise up. And one, one video that if you don't get a chance to play it, Jack, I can, you can put it in the description below. It happens, there's I think five um, people around this plastic table and they have their hands on top of it. And they're talking, it, the video comes in after a long, you know, sort of cuts in after a long session leading up to it where they're interacting with a spirit energy and they're saying, you know, you can lift, you can lift, lift. And then the table lifts up underneath their hand. And this is on the porch of the very same house where I was lucky enough to attend that seance. So I know that it's, and I know that it's not a, a house of trickery. And it's underneath the open sky. So there's no like fishing line, you know, on top of the table. It's on the front porch outside in full light. So it, it is a rare um, success in, um, in levitation that they captured on video that day. And it's on a video um, 
it's a, uh, it's on a video that I then used a clip of in my video. If you want to just search for this, it's called "Anti Gravity Without Technology," and this brings me to my next point. Unless you have questions, uh, I have a thousand questions, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to hear your next point too. Uh, but okay, but but so all right. So the ectoplasm. Did you witness the ectoplasm itself, or do I? Uh, I did, but I didn't witness it turning into anything. I just witnessed it coming out of the um, of the medium's mouth. You can go back and read um, in the history of spiritualism, and ectoplasm is a multi um, multimodality kind of. It's a substance that's that's a connective tissue between the spirit reality and our reality. It's this. It's this. It it can be. Just, it it takes a variety of forms from vapor to like um, cloth, which is why a lot of skeptics thought that it was just cloth that was like secreted in the lips or regurgitated by the, the mediums. It takes the form of like, um, um, sort of like, this will sound reductive, but like porridge, like really just gooey amorphous goo that then solidifies and and um, attains more and more of a definition as it as it forms into like a face a recognizable face, often of a, somebody that one of the sitters in the room knows and loves who has died. And the spirit can use this substance, this intermediate substance, um, as a uh, sort of a vehicle to manifest, where it's much harder to become dense enough to manifest without that, just in the air. Although some spirits can, that's why people see ghosts and why ghosts sometimes touch people like that one did on the back of my my head. So, uh, so you think ghosts are ectoplasmic? No, I think that ectoplasm is something that um, spirit encounter can, in rare circumstances, draw forth from the body of. Yeah, that, that was my impression mm -hmm. that, it, that the ectoplasm came from the body, physical medium, because I've yeah. studied physical, physical yeah. mediumship. Which is why it, Ghostbusters you know, is so stupid you when they extruded from the body. But yeah, so, exactly. so what, what do you think ghosts are formed of? Well, they're not formed. Of, they they partake of a kind of matter that's not the kind of matter that we know. And in my book, I hypothesize that this matter may be what we call dark matter, because dark matter, we know it exists, even though you had um, a, uh, a cautionary uh, episode a couple ago where you said that this one scientist that said, well, maybe the universe is twice as old as we thought, and that takes care of dark matter somehow. But I've, I've since watched other scientists say that that's not the case. And most scientists now, the consensus is and has been for the last 30 or 40 years that dark matter is a necessary um, piece of the puzzle that there's 85% of the matter that we that exists is unknown so far except for its gravitational effect upon galaxies and galaxy clusters um, you know like just briefly galaxies spin faster and more coherently than they ought to just based on the, the gravitational effect of the mass of what we can see and detect that there must be a whole lot more matter that we can't see and can't detect yet, except for its gravitational effect upon these galaxies. And so, as we know from Einstein, matter and energy are interchangeable. They're two sides of the same coin. So there's this kind of matter and energy that is 85% of reality that we don't know. And it suffuses, it suffuses galaxies, it suffuses solar systems, and... Um, the very the lowest estimate that I was able to find of how much there is in this room where you your room and my room and everybody else's room out there it's 50 50 this unknown substance and uh, familiar matter ordinary matter it's called so I think that since we um over all this time of parapsychology have not been able to even scratch the surface of explaining such things as levitation and um telepathy remote viewing i think that this other i call it invisible matter versus ordinary matter this invisible matter um, is the only potential candidate for explaining how this stuff happens that we can't otherwise we have not the foggiest notion of how to explain it within um within the you know the um theoretical uh, framework that we are familiar with it's got to be something like that. I don't think that spirit can be made of nothing. It's got to be some something, some substance. And the um, the characteristics of dark matter fit the bill in that there it's there, 
but we can't detect it with our um, our instruments because the instruments are all have all been um, designed and built and calibrated according to ordinary matter, not according to this other kind of matter. And so I think that it's at least a possibility, and I try to discuss this in, in my book, UAPs and the Afterlife, um, that, for instance, in the case of levitation, when people are like feeling, and you can see this in the video that we might get a chance to play, or it's in the one I mentioned a while ago, called Anti-Gravity Without Technology, people feel that the table is floating, floating. It's not, it's not um, like jerked up by some energy from below or, or, or pulled up. It's just, it's buoyant, it's buoyant. So I feel like um, these two kinds of matter have a certain default ratio most of the time. But when um, something spiritual is happening, a spiritual event, um, a physical manifestation of the intervention of spirit, I think the ratio changes. I think the ratio of this very light, I forgot to mention that dark matter is much, much, much less dense than our ordinary matter. We already know that. And that's another reason why it fits the bill of what could be spirit matter, you know? And so I think that the that um, a conscious agent, uh, a, a gifted medium or a spirit who's able to do this can change can shift the ratio in say a table or a, um, a trumpet um, or any number of other things. They can do it with they can do it with rocks. They can create rocks out of nothing. I think that they there's a inter um, interplay of this very very low density invisible matter with the regular density stuff that we're we're um, used to and that the ratio changes and when say a table becomes more suffused with this invisible matter than usual it can become essentially lighter than air and um a uh and then i'll shut up for a while i'll let you ask questions <laughs> no oh, you're no, doing no. great chris this is There's, fascinating just, you know I just, I, I, i've experienced too much some coffee of this stuff. too much uh, coffee what was that <laughs> too much coffee no, I love about... it, because you know, I've experienced some of this outside of the seance. Yeah. You know, I've had I've had in a port, I've had disembodied uh, voices, I've experienced you know, the, the levitation, the, the other other things that I have been present. Oh, I didn't for. know. I didn't uh, know but, that. But I, 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 yeah, well, yeah, me, I don't want to get. I, I let try me not step to aside for a moment, and why don't you tell us a little bit? No, yeah, it, and, 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 uh, and, uh, off, better, off, off, yeah, anyway, synergy. I, We're not synergy, man. You talk, I'll talk, and we'll together we'll create. Well, I'll, I'll, tell, than, I'll tell about the airport. Okay, I'll tell about the airport. Yeah, All right, more than the uh, sum of our parts. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this this appears in every single video I've ever made. Oh, this yeah. is the the Zeta tag from uh from the car that I'm driving. This was it was it was my stepmother's car, and she was a member of the the, the Zeta sorority when she was in school, and when she was an adult. Her whole life revolved around the women's group that was an outgrowth of the Zeta sorority. She was the president. She was the treasurer. They restored this mansion in downtown San Antonio. Uh, her whole life was revolved around this, the, around the Zetas. Uh, so it was. Uh, so the Zetas are inextricably linked with her. So you know, she passed uh, a few years ago, and. Um, at the time, I was still kind of an atheist, uh, you know, materialist, not non-believer in the spiritual, and I, um, you know, but I was I was starting to get into spirituality because I was starting to do ghost hunting and stuff and, and have some experiences, and I was like, yeah, maybe there's something there. And um, but this was one of my earliest experiences. We had remodeled the house. My wife and I had remodeled our house. Uh, to sell it so that we could come here where we, where you know that seller house in Austin to move to College Station. And so we had remodeled this house, uh, re, uh, new paint on everything, uh, new floors. Uh, there's not a stick of, of anything of ours left in the house. I had inherited this car, uh, my stepmother's car, uh, and I had removed the Zeta tag from it because I'm not a member of the Zetas. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, with all, I love the Zetas. We, we had her service there and they're great people. And some of them were very helpful and, and you know, at the after aftermath of her passing. And uh, great guys, great, great ladies, uh, but not not a Zeta. So I removed the Zeta tag. I probably threw it away. I have no idea what what became of the Zeta tag. Uh, but a few months after she passed, well, maybe about it, maybe six months, maybe two year, uh, we had remodeled the house. Then I was doing the walkthrough afterward, and on this new floor, uh, 
right near the front door or not too near, but in, in the entryway, uh, was sitting right where I couldn't miss it was the Zeta tag. On and you recognized it as the same one. I mean, um, same one, like the same amount of wear and tear, and not not brand new and all that. Yes, as, as far as yeah. I can tell, it's the exact same Zeta tag. It even had even has the uh, the the part on the back where you can you see where I had removed it from the car. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the metal. Uh, so well, it, I mean, you, know, you was, didn't put it there. Your wife I, didn't. Put I didn't it there. put it there. Uh, so we had the, the painting done, you know, be, before we put the, the wall of the floor on, obviously. So if the painters had found it or something, they would have put it on the kitchen counter or something. Right. They wouldn't have put it on the floor. And if they had put it on the floor, if they had found something in a closet somewhere, well, guess what? The floor was no longer there because it was taken up immediately afterwards uh, and, and, and completely replaced. And, and so, so it was some... on the replaced floor that this appeared. So something that was inextricably linked to uh, my stepmother, Harriet, uh, that I couldn't associate with anything else. Anybody else. She made sure that it wasn't ambiguous at all. Not at all. Not uh, at all. That's and, amazing, uh, Jack. I love that. Well, that's the thing. They can, they, can, they can take things that were once somewhere else and move them to where they want them to be. And I feel that, at least within my hypothesis, it could be that they suffuse it with this invisible matter. It becomes invisible it becomes um you know the ratio becomes such that it's more invisible matter than regular matter and then they, they can transport it to where they want it middle of the, your floor um and and so and um this is all to say thank you for, for sharing that this is all to say that what i experienced and what thousands and thousands of other people have experienced since 1848 1850 when it, when things really got going with seances in this country and the UK and then throughout Europe for the last still going on. People think that spiritualism died away. Well, it's, I'm in a I'm in a spiritualist circle via Zoom that's taking place in England right now that's been going for 10 years. And they have spirits coming through and telling people about things that only the person knows. Um, so it's still happening. It's just more underground because of the um, oppressively materialistic you know, um, mindset that we're in and, and the therefore the ridicule that, that folks want to avoid by staying private, but it's still happening. And so for 250, now 1850, so for 175 years, this has been going on and people have been experiencing these things in seances and outside of seances like you did. Well, I think it's a microcosm of what we're seeing with the UAP phenomenon. I think that, um, you know, people... Uh, describe the uh, the the visitors uh, um, contactees describe the the grays for instance as um, not being bound by gravity they sometimes float around well you know we don't say well what's their propulsion system similarly I don't think we should say what's their propulsion system but even about the, sh the craft you know um, physicists and interested scientists and, and thinkers are are pulling their hair out for decades and decades trying to figure out, you know, like um, Bob Lazar, et cetera, et cetera, what it is that technology can bring to bear to allow um, for the transcendence of gravity. Well, why does there have to be some technology? I think spirit, um, which is psychic potential, psychic, um, um, psychic uh, phenomena can create all, all the same um, manifestations that we see in the UAP field. And I know that um, that would get pushed back um, if any of the prominent scientists say, say it, because again of the materialism that we are suffering under. Um, but actually, I know that I tend to ramble, but I have an idea that there's there's a small m materialism, which is just using our ordinary framework, and that's not. That's not up to the task of explaining how levitation occurs or how um, how spaceships spaceships how UAPs can go from zero to two thousand miles an hour like, like that. It's not up to explaining that. Then there's the capital M materialism that embraces both ordinary matter and this other kind of matter that we know is there in great abundance, but that we don't know anything about. So it's the best candidate, lacking you know. Um, failing any other candidate that may come along or pending i mean pending any other candidates that may come along it's the best one to explain in a sort of holistic way 
how um, how the ratio of kinds of matter can explain these um, events, these episodes that otherwise have zero explanation within our small m materialism. So I think that the um, the propulsion hounds um, out there, like Jack Sarfati and and many, many others are barking up the wrong tree. They're barking up the small M materialist tree, not the not the wider materialism, the broader um, encompassing materialism that needs to be put on the table if we're ever to unpack the, the real mystery at, at play here. <laughs> no, no, you're here to talk, man. I love it. You got it. <laughs> I, I love it. So uh, ghosts are made of dark matter. You heard it here, Post. You you, you heard it here, guys. Uh, Chris has an awesome new theory. Uh, let me well, know. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's not original to me, but I do think that in in my new book, UAPs in the Afterlife. Um, that's the last time I'll plug it. But, no, no, we're, we're, I want to get into that. I want to get into. You that. should. You should. If you're interested in this, you should. You should get it, but you don't need to get the paperback. There's a Kindle version, which is only three ninety nine, and it's better because the pictures are are um, much better than in the print version. The pictures are are color and crisp, and there's a lot of images in the book. So I buy the cheaper one if you want to get it at all, the Kindle. And the audio version is coming out in three weeks or so. So, so okay, okay, so so getting back to the UFOs, and you, you say basically don't worry about what the propulsion is because it's more esoteric than we could ever imagine. It's 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 easy to imagine once you bring into the picture the, these two kinds of matter, um, and uh, I call it the, my matter type ratio theory. There are two matter types we know already, and that it's already known. We don't have to reach for unknown, imaginary um, explanations. We, we we know that there's two matter types, and if you stipulate that, then we can understand quite readily. I think how changing the ratios of them and having conscious agents be in charge through intent, conscious intent, just like, you know, we can, gifted people can can do telekinesis, psychokinesis through intent. I think intent drives everything. Um, you can do remote viewing through intent. You can do telepathy through intent, clairvoyance and precognition and all that, all the good stuff through conscious intent. I think that's the engine at the root of, of all these phenomena. And if you have, um, a, a huge uh, population of um, these aliens, which is a whole nother story about where they come from. But um, if you have a huge population of them, say the grays, and they're operating as a hive mind, you can understand, you can readily, um, seems plausible that they can effect changes in our physical world that are, um, radical as radical as um um as um saucers and cylinders and triangles moving through the air i mean it's really a difference in degree not a difference in kind from a levitation inside of a of a seance i think the seances are a microcosm of what we're witnessing on the macro scale when it comes to um all spiritual all spiritual phenomena including and i include that um with uh with aliens and and their uh, their machinery i think that they i think that we're just underestimating the power of spirit um when we turn to me mechanistic explanations or or we seek mechanistic um a par the paradigm of me mechanism and small m materialism i think that we're just underestimating what spirit can do because 99.9% .9 of people who are thinking about this who have never issue this this range of issues has never sat in a seance and seen what what is possible without technology well i've heard peter maxwell slattery and i'm going to interview him uh, next week by the way uh he said that uh, of all the ufo activity that we see in the sky like 90 percent of it is other dimensional there's only like the bottom 10 percent that's like nuts and bolts ufos but okay so but there do seem to be nuts and bolts ufos and people like michael herrera and others We'll talk about how we've been able to reverse engineer, or maybe we were gifted some technology, but we've been able to get some some stuff to work, and we have our own uh, UFOs. Uh, what, what do you say to people like that who say we've got our own UFOs, so thus there must be some you know propulsion that we can understand uh, so, somehow? But remember what Michael Holbrera has, has also t told us, shared with us, is that there's this program, the P3 program, where they um, they uh, they pluck 
um, gifted folks, psychically gifted folks out of um, populations, Native Americans, um, developing countries. They, they take, they find them somehow, blood tests, I don't know. And they, they, uh, they abscond with them to these centers where they give them and their families, take their families too, and they give them a great life. And they they sort of um, suck suck the juices the psychic juices out of them, in order to make an interface with the, the craft and the uh, the visitors the aliens, and without that I mean they wouldn't do they wouldn't go to this extent um, this elaborate uh, program if it weren't necessary if the psychic spiritual um, part of the equation weren't indispensable. So I think that that only reinforces the idea that it's not a mechanistic. Um, technological um, avenue that we need to go down. It's 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 the the interface between mind and matter, and and I think that mind is this spirit stuff I'm talking about. Whether it's dark matter or some other similar kind of stuff that we don't yet understand, but that inter interacts with our our world and changes its its um and uh, uh oh I lost my train of thought. Um, that happens happens well well i'll just say that you know i've had maybe a couple of ufo experiences the first one was blink and you miss it but the second one you know I, you've probably heard me talk about before my jesus ayahuasca ufo yeah which was a you know i was not on ayahuasca when i saw the ufo but it was very yeah. connected to that event and uh it was a very mystical experience and i've been in uh to several ce5 events uh, where people were having these experiences, but they weren't like nuts and bolts, you know, UFOs and, and, and beings like flesh and blood beings they were experiencing. They were out of body experiences and they were seeing beings of light and stuff like that. And it was a more mystical experience than uh, I would have thought, you know, going into it. Uh, so I think that um, it's, it's um, the central concept is density. When we see, um, when um, John Bell, for instance, whom I'm very glad that you're promoting, this Florida researcher who has been getting all, all these um, orbs and and traveling, um, what do you call them, uh, lights that change direction and everything above him in, in Southern Florida. Um, I think that they, they aren't necessarily nuts and bolts, but I think they can increase their density. And when there's a visitation of a craft on earth, it's, its ratio of ordinary matter to this um, um, rarefied matter is increased enough that it, it becomes dense. And that's why they don't stay long. I don't think they can um, abide the dense, the dense, um, um, uh, the dense mode for very long. And then that's why they go back up there. I think they, they change their density. And when they get down low, they're nuts and bolts. And of course, um, or smooth and, animal skin like and the, the the ones we make where we're trying to replicate that they're nuts and bolts because we don't have we don't know how to manifest matter with our minds so we build these things and then michael herrera's um p3 program would would um explain that we we pluck these people out who are psychically gifted and that allows us to animate these ships that we build with the help of aliens not just by ourselves because we're not strong enough we're not powerful enough and it may be that the hive mind of the aliens is is you know overwhelmingly more um more influential in manipulating our ordinary reality here than any one of us who has psychic gifts i think they they're they're employing that brain trust or the mind trust or spirit trust um to to um effect to affect this remarkable um levitation that these ships can um achieve and um you know when somebody when a contactee sees these grays floating through the room they get their arm like their arms get taken by the hands of these grays, and then they are floating i think they too are buoyant like this table like any object that levitates i think they become infused with this rarefied kind of matter energy matters same thing and they can then go right through the window right through the roof roof of the car roof of their their um, house that's what they describe and um in uh, john mack's book um passport to the cosmos he has many testimonials where people say that it feels like their cells are are um um separating it feels like they're becoming like air or like light 
when they're in the company of these abductors, and then and then their their um density decreases enough so they can pass right through ordinary matter. That's because they're suffused then with a higher ratio of this non ordinary invisible matter, maybe dark matter. Um, so I think it all fits together for me. Um, I think that the in the case of the Nazca mummies, to circle back to that, um, I think that they just happened to die in the dense state. So they couldn't go back to their default state of rare, rarefaction. Uh, that's a word I think it is. Um, I said that right. Uh, <laughs> you did. They you did. They, uh, they were sort of, it's sort of like musical chairs. They got stuck oh, right when they were at their densest. So that's why we still have their bodies. Um, I think that they were revered as gods by the people of the time all over the world, as we've seen the tridactyl um, cave paintings and ceramics and textiles, et cetera, et cetera. I think that they were revered all over the world, not just because they were short and cute with three fingers and three toes, but because they could disappear and they could change their density. They could make things rise like, like uh, great big stones and building, building these megalithic structures. I think they had that psychic power, perhaps, not perhaps, probably because they were working in a hive mind, unlike us. We have a certain oneness spiritually, you know, we're all one that way, but we don't have a hive mind. And so I don't think we can conspire to um, accomplish macro, macro psychokinesis like they can. Um, and I think that's because they, they can marshal this other form of matter energy bring it into this frame from outside our familiar reality frame and bring it into our familiar reality frame and then pretty much um katie bar the door it's like all bets are off they can do almost whatever they want including hybridize go through a hybridization bonanza like apparently happened back 1200 years ago or a thousand years ago or back 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 i think i think the reason so much so many of these um aliens look insectile or reptilian to me likely relates to the fact that life on earth itself began that larger creatures were first insects 400,000 years ago and then 320,000 years ago came the reptiles and these two branches of the tree of life were um, much more dominant than than um, mammals so I think that this consciousness that has incarnated um, in um, body plans of Earth zoology first first fiddled around with um, our genomes, uh, the genomes of, of Earth life through insects and reptiles. And that kind of puts a, a broad timestamp on when they began their work, which is pretty good a long time ago. Um, and so I think that's why, and then once primates came along, it began to incorporate um, our uh, genetic material into their experiments. You know, you, you um, reported on this, that the name in the Incan language, or perhaps, um, I don't know if it was Incan, but one of the languages back then, or the citadel where these um, mummies are found is the laboratory. And also it relates to the word seed. I think that this was one place among countless places across the world where hybridization was just um, running rampant um, through the power of this hive mind operating upon um, earthly genetic materials. That's why I don't think these aliens are from Alpha Centauri or the Pleiades or anywhere far away. I think that all stem, it all roots, roots up from the um, life life as it has developed on earth i think that this consciousness that has incarnated now in a variety of forms and now flies around in objects levitating um is uh has been using our zoology i think we need to look no further than the earth for this um so i'm working that out in a new book but anyway um one final point before we move on to further final points is um if if these um, craft, if these ships were using ordinary um, kinds of energy, they would all be hot on thermal. But the shocking thing is that many, if not most of them, are cold on thermal. That movie that, that I think you've referred to, A Tear in the Sky, 
features a guy who um, who tracks some of these triangles and other shapes way high in the stratosphere and on thermal. And you can see right on the screen in that documentary, it says like 80, 80 degrees below zero. You know, if, if, if these ships um, obeyed the law, the, the first law of thermodynamics, which is conservation of energy, it would dump out a whole shitload of heat um, in accomplishing what they do. They're just using so much energy. This guy, um, Knuth, Knuth, Kenneth, Kevin Knuth from the University of Albany, who's been on a lot of shows lately, he talks about the, um, the Tic Tac and how it was um, um, on radar. It was seen to go from 80,000 feet down to 50 feet in one in either 1.65 seconds or 0.65 seconds. That's anyway, amazing. incredibly hot. He says that would be a 5,000 um, G-force. 5,000 G-force. So no, we so, can survive that, Chris. So we can do that. We're going to be fine. <laughs> Just got to uh, take your Wheaties in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah, but quite aside from what that would do to a physical object, that's why I think they're undense. And then they, they get dense when they want to. I think that uh, you know, they're, they're not dense the whole way or else that would be more difficult maneuverability wise. I think that um, he said that, that that just moving from there and that fast and stopping that quickly would release uh, enough energy to power uh, some amazing thing, like to power the East Coast for a month. You know, it's just like an, a ridiculous amount of massive energy. Instead, it's cold on thermal. And that's because it's not using any technology that obeys our laws of thermodynamics. Um, and I think, I think the reason it's cold has something to do with the, the same reason. And I, you can see, I try to synthesize these things and I may, in my effort to synthesize, I probably cut corners and, and uh, overreach, but it's what I'm trying to do is, I think it's related to the reason that in haunted houses, we have these cold spots, like, like, I and my friend Catherine felt in that room with our Ouija board and our automatic writing, it was suddenly get cold. I think that um, the other kind of matter, this invisible matter is so rarefied that when its ratio increases within our frame, our, our frame of reference, it spaces out, spaces out the molecules. And just like at the top of a mountain, you get colder. Um, I think that this low, density level is just intrinsically colder that's why um that's why uh you get cold in haunted houses that's that so many cases of seances i didn't feel this but back in the history that i've been reading it's fascinating the history of spiritualism and dd home and many other um mediums when things are starting to get funky and things are going to happen you can have spiritual um uh, manifestations, voices, and hands on your face, and and stuff. It sometimes it's not just gets cold. It, you can feel a wind of cold coming through, like a uh, like a it's called a psychic wind. There's actually a category for it. You feel this coming through, and I think that's the low density kind of matter that we don't have instruments for surging in and spiriting a, a room or or a, a space. And I think that there's um the reason that these high-flying um, UFOs, UAPs, are cold is, is similar. I think their ratio of this low-density matter is such that they don't they don't obey our our laws of energy and heat. I think they're 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 um, very um, wispy and vaporous, though they might be visible way up there. And then if they come down, they they get solid. So you can throw a rock at them and they clang and you can be taken aboard them. Um, uh, and then, but they don't hang around. And I don't think they go all the way up to what we consider heaven. I think that um, because people don't describe being abducted and then taken up anything that looks like near death experiences in the sense of gorgeous vistas and a, a sense of, of being home. They, some of them say it feels like going home, but I think that's just because they're in that direction. But I don't think they go all the way there. Because we don't get taken to the to um, um, heaven, we get taken to some austere way station, some tank like or or um, like a clinical room where all this hideous stuff is done to us. That's not heaven. I don't think they can go to heaven. I think they can't they can't ground themselves fully on on the earth, or they would stay around. 
and just hang out with us. And I don't, and for some reason, therefore, they can't get all the way up. I think that their bandwidth is simply narrower than ours. And I think that's why they have been taking us and taking our um, genetic material and trying to merge with us, hi hybridize with us, in order to, to um, try to recoup or, or co-op or, or um, um, gather for themselves some of what they're lacking that we have, which is this wide sweep of spiritual elasticity or um, um, spiritual range that they don't have. I, I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from, but that's kind of where I'm thinking right now. Yeah, no, I, I love that because I, I quoted I quoted you uh, one of your books was Indians oh, yeah. in the Afterlife Thank you. Thank a couple you for weeks that. ago, and you yeah. know, uh, you know, examining you know the question why so many alien abductees and contactees have the beings seemingly interested in their souls and playing yeah. with their consciousness and stuff like that, and in right. uh, your idea that they don't have access, you know, we, we may be limited in this in this body but we have access to our higher selves or whatever in that other place. And they may not have access to that other place. Yeah. And, and that is I think we go back. I think we go um, up and up and up and up. I think we eventually can get back to source when we um, evolve enough, spiritually, morally, intellectually, whatever it is, whatever um, label you want to put on it. We, when we evolve as a, as a, um, individual, we then eventually get up to the source, to the source of love and light um, and all that's all that's good, the ecstasy. And I don't think, I think if they could do that, they would they would go there. And if they could be here, they'd be here. I think why else would they be boomeranging back and forth between, you know, across the visibility threshold, across the density threshold, um, you know, perpetually throughout history, uh, up and down, up and down, but never staying here, never staying there. Why do that? And why why try to grab us and poke around and grope? It, it's like they're groping for that uh, essential spark that'll give them what they want in order to go home. Perhaps I, it's just you, you know it's it's still um, it's still an inchoate idea for me, but I'm trying to think about it. Okay, well, okay, we've, we've got it. If there are any hybrids watching, uh, <laughs> I am very curious. Did yeah. it work? Did hybridizing with humans uh, give you access to those higher dimensions? Just uh, take, take, take it a poll, guys. Take it yeah. a poll. All right. Well, sake, just tell us. Just let tell us, us know. Let us know. We won't tell anyone. Uh, okay. Okay. Changing gears a little bit. Changing gears. I know you've done a lot of work on Bigfoot. Uh, what? Tell us about Bigfoot. Well, I think that Bigfoot, I, I used to scoff at people who said anything like this. I used to think that they were simply a, a, um, a this world evolutionary product, another primate like ourselves, and perhaps uh, hybridized with us at some point because their mitochondrial DNA, which comes to the, from the mother to the mother, 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 the mitochondrial DNA is always tested out through tissue samples to be human. So I think that, so I thought, well, they were hybridized between human females and some primate male that we don't yet know about. Because, the, uh, the nuclear DNA doesn't equal um, either Neanderthals or Denisovans, so it can't be them, some other. But okay, okay, slow down just a little bit. Some people won't be familiar that there is <laughs> Bigfoot DNA. Now, I, I've researched yes. it, and I, I know there's Bigfoot DNA, but tell us a little bit about that. Um, a lot of people in 2008 began submitting um, samples that they got. Of, there are people who live at what are called habituation sites, where the Sasquatch members of the local Sasquatch group will be more familiar and less fearful, and less alienated or, or um, standoffish. And they'll kind of like interact with the people who live there and the people will become less freaked out and there'll be this interaction, but never direct, never coming out and having a, a beer on the front porch. The, most sightings are fleeting and at night or like the, the Sasquatch will lean out from behind a tree and look at you and then lean back. And um, so some of these people um, submitted hair samples. And in one case, there was a woman who would feed her um, juvenile Sasquatch. I, why am I doing quotes? Her juvenile Sasquatch um, pancakes on a paper plate. And she would go down there at night, always at night, and, and say, come here, my little man, and put the pancakes <laughs> down. And 20 minutes later, it would come up from the woods, and it would sit down and eat the pancakes on the banks of a of a uh, catfish pond. 
anyway, and one time they found a big butt print on the uh, on the mud at the catfish pond after a rain. <clears throat> anyway, one time, so these researchers went down there and kind of co-opted the situation and put um, super glued shards of glass onto the plate and then the pancakes on top. And sure enough, it came up and ate the pancakes and left blood on the plate. So they had that sample too. That's not a good you know? pancake, guys. <laughs> I'm sure it, it healed up. and fine. Um, but because of that, we got DNA. We got DNA. We got DNA from hair. We got um, scat, which is harder to extract DNA from because it has all these microbes in it. But um, we got tissue, we got hair, we got blood, we got saliva on fruit um, and other sources of blood that I could tell you about. And these all got sent into this woman named Melba Ketchum, who is a forensic um, geneticist and um, veterinarian from in Texas. You're, you're stomping ground. I forget just what part of Texas she was. And what she was did the this... Bigfoot in Texas. Oh, they were from all over, okay, all over North America. And what about, uh, I mean, the, the 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 evil pancakes was that was that Texas? No, that was Kentucky. Kentucky, I okay. got. Yeah, but I got some excellent footage of the Sasquatch in Texas. What? Right outside of uh, right close to Tyler, Texas, where I visited. Okay. Yeah. yeah, where I visited a, a habituator friend of mine um, five times, and one one night I got thermal footage of. Of a Sasquatch while we were we were having um, roasting uh, marshmallows and hot dogs at a bonfire. I took my thermal camera every now and then and went outside the firelight and scanned the tree line. And I was looking for an enormous upright figure, you know, looking from behind a tree. Instead, I saw a, like a bar of, of light, meaning heat, um, just kind of horizontal. And I thought, oh, that must be just some rock that got heated by the sun during the day and it's still warm. Well, I went back to Vermont, back home, and I reviewed the footage and it's an arm an arm sticking out and going like this um, and leaning against, it, it was behind a, a lumber pile um, and peeking. You can see two huge eyes peeking through an opening in the lumber pile. This thing was spying on us, which is extremely difficult behavior for Sasquatch. They like to watch people, especially at campfires, because they know that our eyes are going to be all dilated and they can't, we can't see them. Uh, and so uh, you can see that. Maybe you'll put it in the description. It's called um, the Woodpile Sasquatch footage. On, on YouTube. It's old. It's like um, 16 years ago. Anyway, that was in Texas. But so all these um, DNA samples got um, sent to this woman, um, Melba Ketchum, and she did a study that came out in 2012. And everybody, of course, with the um, conservatism of the mainstream science, there was this ferocious pushback and everything. And plus, She's um, a woman. She's blonde. She's from Texas. She's a veterinarian rather than a PhD, you know, genetic engineer or whatever. Um, so there were all these strikes against her in the prejudiced eyes of the, uh, judge, the, the powers that be. But basically, uh, she worked with other labs. She didn't just do it all herself. She farmed these out to other labs and didn't even tell them what, what she thought this was. And um, it, it came back time and time again, that the mitochondrial DNA, which is which is just the mitochondria in the cell, and it's, it's only 15,000 base pairs as opposed to the billions of base pairs in the nucleus. And it just comes through the mother. The mother DNA is human. And that's all she was able to really um, ascertain, except in the other labs, um, except for the fact that they could tell that the, the uh, nuclear DNA, which comes from mom and dad, was not human. And was not Neanderthal, was not Denisovan. So it was confusing mosaic of a lots of different kinds of, of um, indications of, of animals, mammals. Um, and she also, she kept saying, and back then I thought she was crazy because she's a Christian, not crazy because she's a Christian, but crazy because she let her fundamental Christianity, I thought, invade her interpretations to an unscientific extent. I thought, um, she said, well, um, these, I think th th this nuclear DNA has some, some extreme peculiarities that don't look natural. It looks like they were engine. it was engineered. It looks like there's some single stranded DNA, which doesn't make sense in nature. And there's other um, abnormalities or aberrations that made her think that it had been engineered. And she, she thought that might be the Nephilim and that this engineering was the um, the uh, um, the loving between uh, fallen angels and and um, 
human women, but she also said it might be from the star people. So, um, so, and so there's that, and then there's the fact that Sasquatch, unlike any other any other mammal, can um, can produce light from its eyes. And a lot of people are going to be switching the channel at this point, but um, I have many um, testimonials from people who are absolutely 100% positive that there was no ambient light, so that it wasn't reflection. I have a friend, my friend Jeff, who was out and it, it was a rainstorm and they really wanted to go back home with the guy who was taking them out said, no, just a, few, you know, a little bit farther, we'll get to where they usually hang out. And they go down a little bit more and it's raining and it's utterly pitch dark. They have flashlights, of course, but then they get to this garden, they hear a growl, and they turn off the flashlights and there's a whole set of glowing eyes and they can see them blinking. And, and Jeff saw one turn to um, another individual next to it. And you can see the other individual's face suddenly became illuminated by the eye, the light from the eyes. So nothing else does that. But what does that? People say that the aliens sometimes have glowing eyes. Hmm. I think that Sasquatch and also also Sasquatch can um, um, profoundly affect electronics. People's batteries will be drained, just like with aliens. People's batteries will be drained. They're, um, they're, I had this happen myself with a thermal camera when I was taking, trying to um, get uh, footage of this juvenile who was climbing an apple tree near me. I had the, my um, thermal camera on, and it suddenly was blocked by this black kind of shape that looked like a black fabric that was being hung over the over the lens. It just blocked, 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 and then I turned it off, and it's worked fine ever since. It worked fine always before that. But they could affect not only machinery, but they can what's called zap people. People are frequently, um, Sasquatch researchers will be out in the field and they'll hear wood knocks and they'll know it's a Sasquatch there because there's no people around because it's the middle of freaking nowhere. And they also hear um, vocalizations that Sasquatch make, like especially whooping sounds. And, they'll, and then... Don't do that too suddenly, loud. A Bigfoot will show up. And I know. He, he might Don't. be mad about those pancakes. So I, I yeah. Don't you doubt that I've made that sound a million times out in the woods hoping they would come. Um, so, and then people will suddenly be hit by this, this um, pulse of electricity. Some people think it's infrasound, but infrasound doesn't disable electronics. So I think it's electromagnetic waves of energy. People hmm. become nauseated. They'll get down on their knees and feel like they want to throw up. They'll actually throw up. They'll be dizzy. They'll be disoriented. They get lost in forests that they've been to a hundred times before and never been lost before. Um, so, so Sasquatch, at least those two things, in addition to all sorts of paranormal um, um, manifestations that seem to associate themselves with Sasquatch that I could get into if this were a three-hour show, um, seem to indicate to me that they're more in the camp of poltergeists and and um, aliens and spirits. But they're also flesh and blood. I think that, oh, and I wrote a whole book called Mind Speak about telepathy between Sasquatch and people. They're much more adept than we are at, at all things psychic. Um, telepathy, I don't know about remote viewing because I haven't asked them about that, but I bet you they can. I think they operate in a hive mind. That's how come they're so coordinated as a group, and that's how come it's so damn hard to ever get close to them because they, they communicate and they, they coordinate. And, it, you know... Once you go into the forest, if they're around, it's like, you know, when you put pepper in um, tomato soup and all the pepper goes out to the side. You ever seen that? No? Yeah. Try it. No. no. You have it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to nod and say, yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Some people out there will will, will uh, resonate with that. It's like that. Wherever you are, they're at least 150 feet away, except this one time I got lucky by the apple tree, which is in a documentary I have out called How to See a Sasquatch, if anyone's interested. So I think that there are flesh and blood Sasquatch, but then there are dead Sasquatch who are more um, proficient at manifesting. Like our own sp species, ghosts can manifest. It's very rare. I think they manifest more commonly, which is why people see them disappearing and appearing. Lots of people say that. But I don't think the living flesh and blood ones can disappear. That's just a bridge too far for me. But I think that they can, the, um, the ones who have, um, um, experience physical death can then hang out with their kin and companions more readily here on this plane um, than we can with ours once we die. I think they can, they're more um, 
conversant with the transition, just like aliens are, back and forth, back and forth from low density to high density. And ha have you come across any uh, connections between UFOs and Bigfoot in your research? Um, just by reading. I've um, sat out in the woods for hundreds of nights by myself and, and um, never have never seen hide nor hair of, of a spaceship. Um, but many, many people, as you know very well, have seen the uh, these two phenomena in association, close association, um, physically and temporally with, with each other. I think that I think that whatever consciousness, and I think it's a consciousness that created that um, incarnates in us, and I think it's a consciousness, whatever that is, a conscious agent that incarnates in the whole um, array of of species or types of aliens, including Sasquatch, because these aren't aliens. They're our own duology that is being um, capitalized upon by this consciousness that is trying to replicate itself, trying to um, um, diversify itself here on our planet, just like it, it incarnates in us, it incarnates in in the um, the the different kinds of creatures that it has it has somehow created through its is it efficacy. is this an off world consciousness are we talking alien are we talking i don't think consciousness has a specific spot i think that's why i if i were a remote viewer i could see a book in china and tell you what what the what it says on a spine and i don't think consciousness is is it's non-local i don't think i don't think that the um consciousness that is um that generate engenders the uh, physical forms of aliens and UAPs that we encounter, I don't think that it's located anywhere. It's from everywhere and nowhere is my, my sense of it. Um, so I think all the attempts to pinpoint, you know, um, uh, origins in our ordinary physical space are misguided. I, I think it's not in ordinary space. I think it's in the space of this other kind of matter, invisible matter um, that probably has its own planets you know, people people say that they're taken to other planets. I think it might be that these aren't that these aren't the literal planets that we have in mind. I think they're they're literal, but they're in another kind of matter. Anyway, that's that's getting too yeah. Uh, no, no, sure. I mean, I, I research other dimensions and densities, and the idea that there are planets and uh, you know whole whole realities that exist at other vibration levels or densities or dimensions or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I think they of are. it as vibration levels rather than dimensions. I um, it, I, I kind of the reason I wrote the book called "There Is No Veil" is I don't I I kind of shy away from this notion of otherness in terms of an other place. I think it's a, a smooth transition of of frequency because when like ghosts come and go they often um they often manifest and den densify um gradually and then they gradually fade away i think it's a smooth transition i don't think there's any you know um barrier obje objective barrier i think that you know our our ability to perceive them is limited so that's the only barrier but i don't think it exists in in reality Okay, so let me see if I understand this right. So, so uh, I think your theory is that um, is it other dimensional, higher dimensional beings are uh, tinkering with the genes here on Earth and creating a diversity of life forms, which which would make sense in in a, in a major way because so many of these aliens or quote unquote aliens that we see are something that we're familiar with mantis beings or cat people or whatever you know because i mean exactly it, 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 that's it, why it's it, always it makes, it makes a lot of sense it makes a lot of yeah. sense so 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 is that is that kind of your idea yeah. Am I, saying I don't that right? I, I don't know if the, it's uh, uh, it's unclear to me whether if this whole idea is is right whether it's that they're tinkering with on the level of the dna you know microscopically or if they're just bringing these different creatures together and making them uh making them love each other um to create these these hybrids there's there's a common misperception that hybridization outside of species is impossible but it's not there's lots of examples in in birds and in uh even in mammals you know like a lion and a tiger they're different species um and they create the liger which is larger more robust than either of the parents um and there's this um this uh, uh geneticist named eugene mccarthy um, who who has this uh, website called macroevolution.com, 
where he goes into hybridization. He he wrote um, a uh, the definitive book on hybridization in birds, published by no less than um, Oxford University Press. So he's 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 um, no slouch when it comes to the uh, theory of hybridization, and he um, puts out there that there's all sorts of possibilities, even outside of the family, not just species to species, but family to family. And um, results in hybridization. It has all these examples. So I think that it might be that just as when they take um, an abductee uh, on board and they use these very primitive methods, like making a man ejaculate or going into a woman's um, um, uh, ovaries, that's right, ovaries to get eggs, that's a very gross anatomy kind of approach. They're not. You know, you'd think they could get the DNA through some, uh, you know, more subtle means, but apparently not. So maybe when they're hybridizing, they just get these animals and they put them together, like like um, the bonobo and um, uh, what are some other uh, DNA that they found in these Nazca mummies? Um, human and bonobo, perhaps, um, or some reptile. Reptile, they, maybe even insectile, who knows, human. but probably more reptile. Because if they... They've been hybridized. If they, if I'm right, and they've been hybridizing uh, and and messing around and experimenting in the laboratory Earth since 400,000 years ago, at least, when the insects arose and began to take over the Earth. And insects, incidentally, were huge back then. Once they developed, they were huge because the oxygen content then was 35 percent, as opposed to 21 percent now. And this oxygen level allowed them, through means I'm not quite clear on, they become really huge. Um, and so they've probably been hybridizing insects. And then once once reptiles came along, they began mixing that into the brew. Um, and for whatever, in order to, I guess, the idea would be this consciousness um, wanted to become dense, become um, a living, breathing creature. Well, I don't know why. I guess maybe actually um, an Inca creation stories, one of the strands of the creation story, it's very complicated, but one of them says, that this God, due to cosmic loneliness, began creating different things on Earth. I think the consciousness um, that makes us is making us to um, grow and learn and um, expand itself and diversify itself. And um, oh, what's the other idea? Um, ah, can't remember. Um, and I think that the same thing is true of whatever the consciousness is that's creating this whole other class of beings. It it wants to um, instantiate or or substantiate itself, concretize itself, have a have a life in in a dense in you know in a um, a denser life, not just this ethereal kind of life. And that's what it's been trying to do all this time. But apparently, it can't do it enough to just live on Earth. Unless you believe that they live underground, I think they they default to this higher uh, this higher frequency, and they can't they can't be grounded here. I don't. I, I, I'm running out of thoughts because. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, no, you're right. I mean, there's a reason you don't see uh, otherworldly beings just walking down the street. I mean, there's there's something they, they going appear on. they appear from a low density state to a high density state. We see them, and they go back to the low density state. It's a temporary thing, a fleeting thing. Yeah, there's that's the reason you don't. Except very but, but do you think people. there are aliens from other planets that come to visit, or is it all other dimensional? Or, or I don't know. Right word? It's way above my pay grade, but I I lean toward thinking that there's nothing is happening from other planets because we're not seeing anything that doesn't have a um um a uh, um a root and recognizable root in earthly zoology. You know, and so why would these things, people say, oh, convergent evolution. So on another planet, they would, you know, um, you know how seahorses look like horses, but they're not from, they're not related to horses. And there are these ways that maximize um, survival and, and that there could be humanoids on other planets. But I don't, I don't buy that. I think the very fact that we can recognize in all aliens, aliens, we can recognize earthly life forms or, um, permutations of earthly life forms points me anyway to thinking that better to exhaust and explore the possibilities, the explanatory possibilities that are inherent in that fact, 
before venturing out into these much more um, esoteric types of hypotheses that we have no way of testing. We can find out, especially now, thanks to the advent of these Nazca mummies, we can find out concretely how it is that these aliens are built and whether they're, you know, the very fact that they share DNA with us, that's not going to happen from a foreign planet unless there's the seed, the panspermia idea where everything was seeded by an original genesis and which is possible, but doesn't really float my boat very much. I think that it's a consciousness on earth doing all this stuff with earthly raw materials, genetic raw materials, and that um, the very fact that they can mate with us and produce offspring shows that they are of us. And one way of being of us, deeply kindred to us, so that they we can reproduce together is that the original consciousness that made them worked with the tree of life, you know, the trunk of which and the roots of which all go back to the, the same genetic information system that we have and that all, all of life on earth has and that they they um, partake of by creating this whole host of, of um, chimeras, chimeras and um, hybrids and different versions of what our natural evolution um, has produced. And they, they're taking the natural evolution and building a different layer onto it or underneath it or alongside it, um, according to their own designs, their own um, goals that we can't fully understand, except that they want to diversify and perhaps attempt to merge with us so that they can, like we were saying before, so they can enjoy a wider spiritual um reach or potential that they see in us they have much stronger psychic ability so their consciousness is is more focused in that way but perhaps because of that or not they don't have as wide ranging of consciousness to get up to heaven and, and um to live down here they're stuck in the middle somewhere and they're alienated you could say the aliens are alienated from both ends of the spectrum we can enjoy and we don't really have access to living in the middle where they live something like that something like that I no, said no, that, right. that, that makes a lot of sense chris it really does it really does uh okay uh switching gears a little bit uh what are you working on now what is your um, current avenue research and what's your what's your newest book the newest book is, is only just barely begun, so um, there's no real point. It's not going to be ready for probably a year. I do tend to crank these out, but not not so fast that it's, I'm ready to promote it. I have the cover. I sent you the cover the other day. It's called Look No Further. Okay, <laughs> okay. No I, well, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, if, yeah, if you're not ready to talk about it, you know, don't, don't talk about it. It's called Look No Further. Aliens are earthlings who maximize psychic potential. That's the mouthful of a subtitle there. Um, and uh, through AI, through our friend AI, who's going to put all sorts of illustrators hideously out of work, I think it one day come up with a a, a, um, a, a kick-ass uh, image for the front cover. You could show it if you want to scroll up in your Facebook, but you don't have to. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can squeeze that in. I'm not great with, like, editing and stuff. but Maybe I can try it. Maybe put that um, for the. Oh. But but you can share your screen. You want to share okay. your screen? You want to? I don't know how to. I don't. Do, is it I easy? I will hang on just a second. Participants, share your screen. Oh, I see participants. So I'm trying to get you to share your screen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Multiple, okay. Okay. Now you can share your screen. You see that? Yes. Uh, look no. Uh, Christopher heads... Noel. Look no further. Oh, I a cool cover. You can see it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Because now I can't. All right. But well, anyway, <laughs> that's not the that's not the current the current book that um I'm uh, what I've been thinking and talking about today is all contained in it much more detail and more um, eloquently and articulately. It's, it's called uh, UAPs and the Afterlife. So if you're interested in this topic, you might want to pick that up. And as I say, if you if you're coming in late, you might want to uh, get the the Kindle version, which is cheaper and nicer because it has um, some live links and it has beautiful color images instead of cr crappy images that, that are in the paperback that they don't print well um, and you can so. stop sharing whenever you're ready or you can share something else <laughs> well i'd like to share that video that i sent you yeah sure go for it are you seeing anything i'm seeing it i'm seeing it oh good i, I wish we're curious yeah 
That's yeah, the I'm Leslie King it. clone. Okay. Now here's that table levitating. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Looks and like they all have their hands, their hands on top. kind of on the top That's of why it. He's looking back at the camera. Are you oh, getting this? Oh, look at that! They've, yeah, they've all got their hands on the top it's of it. It's a rare. She's she's organized. She's like steering it underneath. Um, oh here, I can do this. I can't hear anything. This is um Stephen Browder, Browdy, B R A U D E, who is a professor of philosophy at Mer in Maryland, um, uh, and also the author of one of the best books on uh, on macro psychokinesis called The Limits of Influence. And he's worked with this man in Argentina who can make a table not go completely off the ground like you saw on that porch, but can make it tilt with his hands on top. I'm not hearing him. Okay, but we 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 can we can infer what's going on. We can just we can just see what's going on. We don't have to infer. We can just see. All right, all right. He he's got his hands. So this guy Stephen Browdy was there in Argentina. So he oversaw this. In, in addition to Argentinian um, investigators, so there's no trickery going on. There's all these different cameras. You see the one on on the base of that leg of the table. There's all these different cameras. And it takes him a long time sometimes, but then it, rise, it just rises up. And I think what he's doing is he has the ability to infuse that table with enough of the other kind of matter, the rarefied low density matter to make it, um, to make that side of the table hit zero on the scale and then sub zero where it becomes lighter than air. That is amazing, Chris, look at that. I'm and so, this I'm is not, uh, yeah you've, I, heard, I, you've heard of table tipping this is this he's he, this guy um Ariel his name is Ariel Farias he's uh, at, he's um operating in a long storied tradition of table tipping it goes way back to the beginning of séances where people are able to to um communicate with spirits by the spirits moving the table like if you say the alphabet then they'll move the table at the right letter and then you spell out words and sentences and the whole thing so this is really quite commonplace. So, so uh, he's he's not moving the table himself. He's inviting the spirits to move it through him. Am I understanding that that right? It's either it's either his own psych, um, spirit embodied who's doing it, or a spirit unembodied. In a way, there's very little difference. Um, a famous old saying is, "We are we are just as much spirit now as ever we shall be. We're we're spirits now. In a sense, we're living in the afterlife right now because we're spirits. We just happen to be." housed in a body but the same as we're going to be in the afterlife so i can i can speed this up a little yeah that'd probably be good yeah oh here's hey, the can, can you ever get it like fully off the table wait sorry are you off the floor can you ever get the table fully off the uh off the ground like that like that i'm sorry what uh, can he ever get the table fully no, off the ground no. like like that? No. Oh, so that's what I'm saying. It's a long tradition. You see these mm -hmm. these guys from way back in the day. They they all could do the table thing, and and there were some charlatans, of course, but they're the genuine ones. And then I'm making the link to flying saucers. Anyway, that's enough. Thank you for letting me show that. No, that was really cool. That was really cool. I'm glad. I'm glad you did. That was that was amazing. So that's the basic idea: is is um, you can have uh, levitation without without technology, and I think that people are really um, on the wrong track, generally. And that's so. This is the thing: I, hey, I you can no, sh stop sharing your screen whenever you feel like it. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. Oh God! Stop share. I see. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Okay. Sorry, right, we're back. We're back. Sorry, I'm so. Um, primitive um but um i think that oh i i just have no track record no credentials for the uap field i just sort of i'm stumbling in here off the street i have no no business talking about this except for the fact that i have this spiritual background and um spiritual research spiritual um investigation research that i've been reading that has shown me that there's another way another paradigm within which to see the uap phenomena 
And so I just want to contribute that viewpoint to the overall discussion and see if it has any, you know, any legs to it. Um, you know, I just wish that some, there's all, this whole pantheon of um, commentators and leaders in the, in this UAP space, as we say, that are um, very influential, but none of them has experienced any of this, um, any of this um, psychokinesis, either in a seance context or outside of a seance context. So they don't bring that to the table. And I think it ought to be. I, I totally agree. I, I love what you're doing. I mean, from my own research and limited experience, you know, it's all connected. You know, yeah. uh, Bigfoot's connected to UFOs and poltergeist, uh, you know, uh, although you can make an argument that that's invisible Bigfoot, but I think that there may be some genuine poltergeist activity associated with it. UFO, there's a poltergeist activity associated with it, uh, and it's also connected to spiritual stuff. It may be lar largely spiritual, uh, you know, I think but it's all connected. You know, the whole hitchhiker effect where somebody experiences one thing and then other things related begin to occur. I think this is because of the concept of resonance. If you picture um, a steel ball, a steel ball hanging down on a thread, uh, you know, just hanging off of a little thing, little uh, structure, and it you, you let it go, pendulum, and it goes back and forth. If you then add back your energy and move it back to its, its um, and give it more energy, it'll go back to its original um, periodicity. But more better example is if you um, have a wine glass, you know, and opera singers and even others can sing at the right note to resonate with the glass, it'll shatter. Some people think that's not true, but it is true. Um, you can do that. You can shatter glass with your voice. It's because you've um, gotten your voice to the same frequency as, as the glass's um, natural frequency. And why does it shatter instead of just match the glass? It's because when you resonate, you add energy to the system. You add energy. That resonance itself creates its own um, um, ex uh, increased energy. Well, I think that when you experience um, a ghost, a poltergeist, a, a, um, a UAP visitation, um, Sasquatch, a, um, a, uh, a gray alien, any kind, of, any kind of alien, I think that it's adding its the only reason you're experiencing it is that your vibrational um, uh, band or range is overlapping with its vibrational range. It's, it's been able to densify in order to come down to our vibration. Well, when, when we resonate, i.e. perceive and experience this um, visitation or this encounter, that adds energy to us. And that energy then makes us more, um, more susceptible more um it increases our frequency and when our frequency is raised like that by having this energy added then we are more equipped to experience other similar high frequency um uh, entities or conscious agents so i think the hitchhiker effect is just our being permitted to privileged or cursed with an expanded range of of um, frequency thanks to the visitation the initial visita visitation and then we there's a holdover effect where we continue to have this uh, expanded range of frequency so that when we go back home, if we are at the Skinwalker Ranch and then we go all the way back home 2,000 miles away, still are experiencing things we never experienced before because we now um, are the, um, are the we now possess a wider, a broader range of, of frequency of our um, ability to experience um, different, different uh, a higher rate of frequency. And then it and then it bleeds over into our family members. So that the person from the ranch who came home, and then her son started seeing um, like a wolf, uh, like a dog man in the backyard, and orbs in the room, and um, other specters. It's because we now have we've been our free our what what would you call it? Like our um uh our uh, what's a word for um, capacity? Our frequency capacity is now larger it's greater because of the original uh the the effect or the influence of the original encounter with something of a higher frequency that makes sense that makes sense that makes sense to me and my own experiences i don't know if they began because i was researching it and my mind was open to it 
or because at the same time I was starting to ghost hunt and I was like coming in contact with stuff. Yeah. And that and it was pumping it, my frequency. Pumping like you with frequency. Exactly. More frequency. Exactly. That's how it yeah. Does. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. We figured yeah, this uh, out. Yeah, we figured so, this no, out. We yeah, said that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. man. Because I've been wondering the same thing myself since since that started to happen. And, uh, you know, my, my experiences have decreased lately. Uh, and I haven't been ghost hunting or doing anything particularly spiritual. So, uh, you know, I, I need to get back in the game. Thank you so much for joining me, Chris. This has been a great conversation. I really loved it. And I think the, the audience got a lot out of it. I hope they did. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, is there a way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, my website is um, the nearness of you dot net. And um, you can get in touch with me through through there. I have um, all my uh all my books on there and uh, Sasquatch research videos and um, UAP videos and various things. So I'd love to, I'd love to be in touch. I'd love to talk. And I appreciate Jack, the, the wide ranging um, atmosphere that you uh, promote here where we can <laughs> sort of like, Hey, I, I love your research. It's, it's wide ranging research. It, it, it's, we can it's drift awesome. around. We can, we can meander all we want and hope to close, <laughs> up, close a couple circles along the way. Well, it's great. And do you have any uh, projects that you think people should be aware of that you're, you know, um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it, I talked about what I'm doing. That's all there is. <laughs> okay. You know, all right. If you're interested, well, if if you want to, um, if you want to mosey on over to uh, my website, look at the, look at some videos and be in touch with, with thoughts and questions, feedback. Um, you know, additional, uh, addition to additional evidence that I, you'd like to share with me or your own work. I, I'd be, I'd be glad. I love networking, making new friends in this, in this realm. There's few enough of us who are out there sincerely, you know, um, uh, working in this, in this vineyard or, uh, that I, any, any new friends I can make, um, including you, my friend, Jack, my new friend, uh, the better. Absolutely, Chris. Well, it's been a, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the last few months, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to sit down and have this conversation. Uh, it's, it's I've really enjoyed it, and uh, you do such great research into such interesting subjects. You know, the connection of UFOs in the afterlife, Bigfoot, metaphysics, uh, all, all near and dear to my heart. I, I love it all, and uh, just thank you so much for joining me, Chris. Oh, you're very welcome. I think we have a mutual admiration society going on here, and it's a little bit sickening, but. Uh, I, <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And uh, uh, give Chris a big shout out in the comments below.